Hello Chem 241 students, Pe Professor James Ormord here again. Uh, today we'll be talking about the acid and base uh, extraction experiment. Uh, in today's lab we're going to be uh, taking three different compounds and separating them by uh, varying changes in their solubility properties. Uh, so uh, what we're going to be doing here is uh, taking a look at a comp one of the compounds is an acid, uh, one of them is a base, and then one of them is neither an acid or a base uh, from an organic chemistry uh, perspective. And what we're going to be doing here is we're going to be uh, using various acid-base properties or treating them with acids and bases to alter their solubility as a way to uh, achieve effective separations. Uh, after we uh, do achieve the separations, uh, we then actually have to purify them, and then we're going to be assessing their purity by melting point, you know, something we've seen a few times already. So here we can go ahead and take a look at the three compounds that we're going to be separating. We have benzoic acid, M-nitroaniline, and paradichlorobenzene. And you guys should have learned your functional groups already in your lecture. Um, but as we see here, we have a carboxylic acid group. Uh, this is going to be our acid compound. So acid. And then over here, uh, we have a couple of different functional groups here, but the one of interest here is the amine, the NH2 group here, which does have a lone pair. And uh, these act as the bases of organic chemistry. So let's hit the base. And then here, uh, we don't see a carboxylic acid group. We don't see an amine group. Nothing that can really act as an acid or a base. Go out and grabbing protons. So we go ahead and call this compound neutral. So it turns out uh, here, uh, before any reactions have taken place, uh, while they do have you know, subtle differences in polarity, uh, these are overall mostly nonpolar molecules. And as such, they are all pretty soluble in uh, diethyl ether, or si simply ether for short. Uh, so the way we're going to start off the experiment here is we're going to go ahead and take you know all these compounds here as a mixture, dissolve them in ether, and then we're going to sequentially treat it with acids and bases to selectively pull out one and then the other. And I'm going to show a flow chart here uh, in, a, in a little bit explaining this. Uh, but before we get into that, I did want to talk a little bit about the arrow pushing here because this is our first time really seeing organic uh, reactions in this class. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna shorthand uh, this particular piece as R. In your actual lab report and your pre-lab, you should be specific on the actual reactions here. Um, but in general, what we have here is we have our carboxylic acid group. And it turns out that this compound is insoluble in water, but soluble in, in organics. So I'm gonna call it, I'm gonna say organic soluble. So org soluble, so org soluble, organically soluble, like diethyl ether. And then what we're gonna do here is we are going to treat this with NaOH. And for here, I wanna actually draw out to everything. So we have a plus charge on the sodium ion, and this is ionic. We have the three lone pairs and the negative formal charge on oxygen, okay. Uh, if you take a look at the dipole moment on this particular OH bond, it turns out that we have a delta minus on oxygen and delta positive on hydrogen. A general trend that we're going to see in organic chemistry all year long is when you're showing the electron arrow pushes, they typically go from electron rich to electron poor. Uh, so here we're going to show the electron rich hydroxide uh, grabbing the electron poor H from the carboxylic acid group. So I'm going to use a blue arrow for that. So there, grabs H, and then uh, this bond needs to break, like so. You can show this in equilibrium uh, due to the fact that we do have a weak acid here, but I'm not overly picky on in this particular class right now. Your electron structure may be, though. Okay, uh, we then have the deprotonated version of the carbo carboxylic acid, referred to as the carboxylate, this one. And if you're worried about mass balance here, which you should be at this point, is uh, we have our sodium ion here to balance. And then our product here is water. So what we've done now here is we effectively ionized 
this compound, which is now aqueous soluble. So AQ soluble, like so. So what will happen here is uh, if you were to treat this with the mixture that had all three, uh, what will end up happening here is that these two compounds, the base compound and the neutral compound would not respond to the base, only the acid compound would. And this compound would selectively go into the aqueous layer. Remember, you know, like oil and water don't mix, and similarly, ether and water don't mix. So if you separate out the two layers, you can effectively separate, separate out the compounds. And then after you have this separate aqueous layer, and you'll see what more in the video, or when we get to the actual experiment, uh, we can then treat this with an acid to bring it back here. And if this was in water, what we should see is a powder precipitate, which we can then uh, collect by filtration. Uh, we do a similar procedure to get the base compound out, except for we now reverse the two, or the order that we add things in. And just so we're clear, I want to go ahead and write in here uh, which, so here if you want to go from with the, with the acid compound to be aqueous soluble, to the base, and then to bring it back to the insoluble form, you're going to use acid. Okay, uh, for the amine group, I'm going to go ahead and shorthand the rest of the molecule as simply R, s similar how I did with this, this example. So the main part of importance in this reaction is the NH2 group, R amine. And we will cover the chemistry of amines in a lot more detail next semester. So the acid we're going to use in today's lab is hydrochloric acid, HCl. And we have very similar arrow push as up here happening, except instead of our base being hydroxide, our base is going to be the amine. So I'm going to go ahead and show the lone pair. Doing that. And I'm going to show this in equilibrium again. And here we get the aminium salt. Uh, some people often refer to this as the ammonium salt, but technically it's an aminium salt. But I will tend to actually say ammonium myself because uh, it's the ammonium salt. People will know what you're talking about. But yeah, like I said, technically it's aminium. But the point here is, is that these aminium salts are water soluble. So just like we saw before, this one here, the amine that we're using in today's lab is organic soluble. And then the aminium salt is aqueous soluble. So we have our mixture of the ether that has you know, all three of these in there. Uh, if we add HCl, only the amine compound should respond to the addition of the acid. And then we'll selectively go to the aqueous layer. We then pull off, separate the aqueous layer and then treat it with base to bring it back to its organic soluble form, which is insoluble in water, which we collect by filtration. So essentially the chemistry is really similar. Uh, the order is reversed for which compound you're trying to get. So just to be clear here, going from organic soluble to aqueous soluble for the base compound is add acid. And then to go to bring it back from the so water soluble one to insoluble, use base. Okay, so uh, after you ran that process for uh, both of these compounds, what you would have left over would be an ether solution that has only this compound in it, the one that didn't respond to the acid or the base. The way we get that one out is you simply just remove the solvent by evaporation on a hot plate. Uh, ether has a pretty low boiling point, so it doesn't take very much heat to get it to boil, and it's really uh, fairly easy to remove. Okay, uh, before we switch over to this experiment itself, I want to show you guys a few things about this piece of glass first. It's our first time seeing one of these in this course. Uh, this is referred to as a separatory funnel. Uh, I will often refer to as a SEP funnel for short. But yeah, separatory funnel is what it is. Uh, here we have a few pieces here. Uh, this one's actually missing a piece, but it's okay for the demo today. Uh, there should be an O-ring inside of here. It's missing, but you can't really tell that much from there, probably. Uh, so we use this to open and close here. Uh, there's a little uh, Teflon plug here. And you guys, I'm not sure if you can see it on camera here, but oops, turn it that way. 
But there's a little hole there that just turns that has it open or closed. And add your liquid from the top here. And when using this, uh, what I recommend doing before you do anything of importance in here is check it for leaks. So uh, I would add a little bit of the solvent I'm gonna use, like ether or water, and check if it leaks. Because you don't wanna be three hours deep into an experiment and all of a sudden you realize that your set funnel has a leak and you lost three hours of work and have to start over. Very bad news, so you don't want that to happen. So check for leaks before you do anything. Um, when working with the separatory funnel, uh, you, you, you'll see it in the experiment, but uh, make sure that you have a firm grip on the separatory funnel. If you have a larger one, you might want to use two hands. This is, a, I see this is the one-handed side. That's pretty small. Uh, this is the 125, yep, 125. So anyway, with the stopper in there, uh, make sure it's not a thermometer adapter. Uh, in the lab, we have thermometer adapters, which look like, they look like a stopper, but they have a hole in it. That doesn't help very much. You need an actual stopper. So uh, you want to hold it with one of your fingers. Uh, some people like to hold it with their index finger, like I do. Uh, some hold it with their thumb, like this. I, for me, I feel this is more, uh, less uh, safe this way, for me personally, but I have seen some people hold it this way. I hold it this way. Just make sure you have some pressure on the top here because you're going to be shaking it. You don't want it to fly off. And the thing is that oftentimes uh, working with organic solvents in here, you're going to build a pressure and working with ether today, you're for sure going to build a pressure because the heat from your hand is enough to, enough to get the vapor pressure really uh, increased on the ether. Push it off the stopper. Uh, so when, when shaking this, uh, make sure you do a few things. One is that you vent periodically. To vent, you simply pull this off, or you can invert it and open the stopcock. Either way works. Uh, just make sure that if you're opening this here, uh, if you're working in a fume hood, I recommend you point it into the back, into the fume hood, or just straight up. Don't point it at your partner or yourself. I've seen students do this many times, and that's dangerous because it could fly out at your face. So try to avoid that. Uh, another thing too, when working with a separatory funnel, is uh, sometimes you're uh, you should have an idea which layer is going to be which, whether the top layer is organic or the top layer is aqueous. In a lot of cases, the organic layer is the top one. Uh, typically, uh, most organic solvents have a lower density than water. It will float on top. Uh, the main exception we see in this class is dichloromethane, which has a density of about 1.3, which will be more dense. But in most of the labs we, we work with in, the, in this course, the organic layer is the top one. And it for sure is today because we're working with ether in today's experiment. Uh, if you're unsure which layer is which, though, uh, what you can do is what's called the water drop test. Uh, all you do is, I do it two different ways. One is you drop a drop of water from the top and watch where it falls through. So if, if it goes into the top layer, the top layer is aqueous. If it falls through the top layer, it goes to the bottom one, the bottom layer is aqueous. Another way to do that too is uh, you can take a pipette and push that into the bottom layer and slowly let out some drops of water and watch where the water goes. Uh, I don't recommend it that way because you can confuse an air bubble for a water drop. So I recommend just drop it from the top, but whatever you're more comfortable with. Okay, I think we are now ready to go ahead and take a look at our experiment. So let's go ahead and take a look at a flow chart of how the procedure is going to work today. I highly recommend that you do a flow chart for this experiment, just to kind of keep track where everything's going. Uh, also label your glassware. So uh, here we're going to be starting with our three component mixture. I'm shorthanding stuff here, so HA is benzoic acid or acid compound, B is our base compound. Uh, M nitroaniline, and then N is our neutral compound, paradichlorobenzene. So the, we're going to start off by dissolving in ether. So dissolve in uh, e ether as shorthanded as ET2O, or you can write ether, it's fine. Uh, what's, what we're then going to do is we're going to add aqueous HCl. So add HCl aqueous, and you guys are going to. Uh, we we'll prepare the solution. So what happens here is we have our ether layer, which has all these compounds, and then we have our aqueous water that we just added. So what we're gonna see is two different layers happen here. The less dense layer goes to the top. In this case, it happens to be uh, ether. So this is gonna be organic on the top, aqueous on the bottom. And then what's going to be in the, in the aqueous layer, it, 
whatever HCl reacted with. So HCl is going to react with the base compound and make a BH plus. So we get BH plus. And then uh, atop in the organic layer, we're going to have HA and N still sitting around in there. And then uh, we, we typically do all the, wa all the aqueous washes first before we come back to these. So I'll come back and talk about what, what, how we purify this in a moment. Uh, so what we do now is we take the organic layer after the ac first aqueous washing and then treat it with base. So we're going to be adding aqueous hydroxide, so like so. And then just like the previous one, we're going to get two layers again. And we're still working with water here, so the organic layer is going to be on top. And then the aqueous layer on the bottom. Oops, I was using red for that. Let me fix. All right. So uh, after we have our uh, two layers, uh, what ends up happening, uh, just like we saw similar here, uh, NaOH is going to react with HA, our benzoic acid, and it's going to make A minus. And that is going to go to the aqueous layer in the bottom. And then the top layer just has N left behind. Okay, so you essentially at this point, after you've done the two aqueous washings, you then have three solutions you have to then pull the compound out from. So uh, here, for the compound that has, or the, the beaker that has BH plus, we treat it with the opposite reagent to bring it back. So we're going to add NaOH aqueous, and that's going to bring it back to nonpolar B or relatively nonpolar B, and we then uh, collect that by filtration and get a melting point, all that fun stuff. Uh, the next one here, the A minus here, we're going to collect this one out of solution. We are going to add the opposite reagent. So we originally added NaOH. We are now going to add HCl. And this will make HA, which we collect by vacuum filtration. And then here we simply just remove the solvent. So remove solvent. And then we have and not an ether, <laughs> like so. Okay, um, if you were to change your solvent here, essentially what would happen, so it's like you use dichloromethane for example, uh, all that would change would be uh, the, what was top of with bottom. But essentially how you would perform the procedure would be the same, just which layer with which. It works out in this particular procedure that it is very convenient to have the organic layer on the top. Uh, if the organic layer was on the bottom, it could be done, but it would be problematic. <laughs> Put it that way. Everybody, let's go ahead and get started on the experiment. Don't forget, proper safety attire, so gloves and goggles are required. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start off by weighing out two grams of the 12121 paradichlorobenzene, three nitroaniline, and benthoic acid. Remember that we have a neutral compound, a base compound, and an acid compound. So the best way to start out is to go ahead and take an Erlenmeyer flask and place it on the scale and tear it. All right, so make sure you get this mass number down. We're going to go ahead and get the mass of the solid by difference. So this is going to be your tear weight. Make sure you write that down. And then we're going to go ahead and add the approximately two grams of the one to one to one mixture and then get a new weight. And then you can get the mass of the solid by difference. All right, there you go. Make sure you write that number down. Get that mass of the solid by difference. All right, now we're over at the fume hood. I have the solid we just weighed out here in the Erlenmeyer flask. Uh, the procedure says to add 30 mils of diethyl ether to it to dissolve it, but I recommend that you add about 20, and then we use it as a 10 for rinsing to transfer it all uh, thoroughly. So here I have diethyl ether. Uh, we always store this in metal containers with uh, plastic lids standard for this. Um, here I have a little bit extra, which is not a big deal because we're going to be evaporating it later anyway. So not a big deal if we have too much. 
Uh, all three of these solids should be very soluble in the diethyl ether, but you want to try to get it in solution as best you can, and then transfer it while it's in a slurry, and preferably without spilling it everywhere. You're likely going to have some in the neck of the separatory funnel. Just make sure you rinse that with diethyl ether, not water. All right, so I still have some left in here. Remember I said we were going to use uh, some diethyl ether for rinsing. If you have too much, it's not a big deal unless you overshoot the capacity of the funnel. I would argue that this part right here is probably one of the steps where you're going to lose most of your material. The very start. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and give it another small rinse just to make sure I'm getting it all the best I can without having too much volume of people. Alright, we're going to call that good enough. Now, when using a separatory funnel, make sure that you're holding it firmly with two hands, preferably. But when I like to hold it, I like to make sure that I use my index finger to hold a nice stopper on this, good pressure, and then you want to shake it and vent it. So, I'm going to invert as well, vent, let some pressure come out. I have a little bit on the outside, so I'm wearing gloves, right? <laughs> I'll wipe that off here in a moment. So the goal here is just to get it, get it as dissolved as best as possible here. Get all in solution. It's a little cloudy still. Probably not going to really get it all to fully dissolve, but do the best we can. Invert, vent. You can vent from the, the stopcock too. I don't like to do that because you oftentimes get material stuck in there doing that. You're less likely to get, get it to the top here. But we are losing some to the top here and because uh, ether tends to do that. We're getting a little bit of build up here. So make sure you remember uh, to write the sources of loss in your procedure. That's definitely a source of loss. Me spilling here is a source of loss. See, the part of my finger is a source of loss. But make sure you mention that. All right, got some glass for ready for the next part. So I got some beakers ready. Uh, just label them some masking tape. I got a label A, B, and M. Just some plain beakers, nothing special about them. Label for later. Uh, for now though, I'm going to prepare an HCL solution and you want to make sure you label these too because otherwise it looks just like water after you've made it. Okay, so uh, here I, I uh, went ahead and pipe it out uh, some of the concentrated HCL. Got about four milliliters here. And then the next part here is I have some water here of roughly 40 mils and you want to always, uh, whenever you're making solutions with acids and bases, you want to make sure you add them in the correct order. Uh, the rhyme I use to remember this is if you're doing what you gotta, acid into the water. That means that acid goes into water, not the other way around. So here I have the water first. Typically, if you're adding concentrated HCl to water, you may see it smoke a little bit. Do not be alarmed. Just you want to just be careful with it. Swirl. Don't add it all at once. So this is an exothermic process, which is why we see a little bit of steam. All right. So there we go. We have our HCl solution. Uh, depending on how concentrated you're, you're making it, you might want to cool this down, but this is actually not too bad. I don't feel any warmth from it. It was just a little bit of acid. And swirl that up. Nice. I like to mix things up in an early mire uh, because they are meant for mixing here because it allows you to uh, swirl like this, not spilling it all over your hand. Where if you get this in a beaker, chances are you may still be spilling uh, on the bench and on your hand. Okay, we're going to go ahead and start the extraction process now. I have my HCl ready. Uh, we are going to pull out the base compound. Uh, right now they're dissolving the organic layer. Uh, we're going to however, add some aqueous HCl. What this is going to do is going to protonate 
the base compound and it's going to go into the aqueous layer. Uh, remember, you're, you're adding water with this as well because this is in water, so you're not going to add water separately per se. Uh, we're going, going to extract a couple times because it is, it is more beneficial to extract multiple times rather than one single time with a larger volume. Which, if you may notice, all the extraction throughout this procedure, uh, I, I wrote in there to extract a couple times rather than once. And once again, you get better recovery this way. Uh, the procedure says to use 15 milliliters. You don't need to be exact here, maybe about 15 milliliters. Kind of eyeballing it. It is not overly crucially, you're super exact here. So uh, we do have the uh, that's aqueous on the bottom, organic on the top. I'm going to go ahead and stop it again, shake it up, and don't forget to vent. This is an ether in here, so if you uh, don't vent, it's going to build pressure and it's going to pop off the stop cup. And it typically looks like uh, the solution clears up quite a bit after you add the aqueous layer to it. So there you got the two layers there. We're going to go ahead and draw it off here in a moment. So shake, invert, shake, vent. Shake, remember, notice I'm holding my finger on there, keeping it nice and secure so it doesn't pop off on its own. Don't forget to invert, vent. All right, and then uh, go ahead and set it onto the ring stand there. And you want to go ahead and let the layers separate. I'm going to raise this just a little bit. Give myself a little bit of room for my beaker underneath. And we are going to be collecting com the base compound, so I'm going to put it into beaker B. When you're draining, you want to make sure that you uh, have the stopper off because the volume needs, or the, if you're displacing the volume, it's going to act as a vacuum if you don't have it open to air. So let's go ahead and drain this bottom part off. I like to leave behind a little teeny bit of the aqueous layer, try not to get any of the organic layer here. So you want to leave a little bit of the aqueous layer inside of the set funnel. Go ahead and drain it down, drain it down. Great. So I have a teeny bit of water in there in the bottom still, which is what I want. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and add the second portion of HCl. Try to get more of that base compound to come out to ionize and go into the water. left over, which it makes sense because realistically I should be using a, about 30 mils here and have a little bit left over. Okay. Now, add it in there. No, uh, notice how the aqueous layer is not as dark as it was for the first extraction. That makes sense because the base compound is actually giving us the yellow color. We're going to have some left behind in the, in the organic layer, but that is to be expected. Right, shake, invert, bent. This part is extremely important. You have gloves on because you may notice I'm getting it on my hands as well. If I wasn't wearing gloves, that would be on my hands. Right, you preferably also don't want to point this towards your lap partner. Point it towards the back of the hood or straight up in the hood while you're opening it. Okay, go ahead and drain off this layer now. Remember, to, you want to leave a little bit of the water behind to avoid getting any of the aqueous or the organic layer. The organic layer is the top one. All right, left a little bit on the bottom there just to avoid any of the organic layer coming through. I am not quite done yet. I have to do one more rinse with some water. So here I have, you know, about 10 mils, 15 mils of water. Looks like about 15 mils roughly. Remember, these, these volumes don't need to be exact. I'm going to add the water to this. Right. 
and then shake, invert, vent again. And then we're going to combine all the aqueous washes into the one beaker labeled B. Shake, invert, shake, vent. Shake, invert, shake, vent. And then the layers are separating there. Wait for them to separate. If for some reason the layers are not separating, typically adding a little bit of salt helps uh, break up those layers if they're kind of uh, having a fuzzy division. Okay, so we'll go ahead and drain off this last uh, water wash and we'll save this part for later. So now we have all three uh, aqueous washing. We wash with acids. This is, this is acidic. Uh, we're going to uh, extract this solid out by treating with a base later on. And we'll come back to that. All right, we're going to do our uh, second extraction. So this time we're going to collect the acid compound. Uh, the way we're going to collect this one, if you remember, if we are going to now treat it with base, that will cause the uh, acid compound to ionize and selectively go into the aqueous layer. The base we're going to be adding is a fairly strong base, 10% uh, sodium hydroxide. So here I went ahead and measured out about 30 mils. I'm going to add this in there in two portions, followed by a water rinse. So get this one out of the way. So let's go ahead and add roughly half of this. Remember, it does not need to be super exact here. It works either way. Little spill there. All right. Let me go ahead and wipe up my spill. You don't want to leave hydroxide in the counter. It leaves nasty white spots in the counter that's hard to remove. Okay, you guys know the drill by now. You want to shake, invert, shake, vent. I like to do it three times. Let's make sure it's got a really good mix. Okay, let the layers separate. And then drain off and make sure you're putting it into the correct beaker. Yeah, if I were if I were to drain the drain this into the B beaker now, it would be bad. Okay, go ahead and drain this off. And just like the previous ones, you want to leave just a little teeny bit of the water behind to avoid getting any of the organic layer. If you did get any of the organic layer, I would recommend to actually pipe it back into the sub well. Because you don't want any organics in your A and B beakers yet. Sorry, organic solvents. All right, I'm going to go ahead and add the rest of the hydroxide now. Preferably without spilling this time. I'm going to offer with this view. Okay. All right, there we go. Stopper, shake, invert, shake. Vent. All right, do it a third time. Make sure you got it really good. I don't think I mentioned it earlier, but uh, it actually is very crucial that you, you shake and mix because of the fact we have the two layers. The chemicals actually have to come into contact with each other to actually react. So I go ahead and drain this layer off. Second uh, base wash. Leave a little bit of the water. Oh, there we go. Leave a little bit of the water behind. All right, now I'm going to go ahead and add some water. 
Give her a last little water rinse there. Layers have pretty nicely today. All right. Last drain. Very exciting. Now we have uh, what our aqueous extractions for compounds A and B. So we are going to recover both of these by adding the opposite reagent. So this one here, we extract the base compound by adding acid. We can bring it back to a base by adding base. And then the reverse for this one, we have the acid compound, which we uh, extracted by adding <coughs> base to it. So then when we add acid, it will go back and then both of them will become insoluble, which we can collect by filtration. Uh, the last bit here, I'm just going to go ahead and pour it into the beaker that we labeled as N. This is the only one they're N to as well, but I put it on this side with masking tape. And we're going to uh, dry this and then evaporate the solvent. I do want to point out that the only colored compound out of all these that should be colored is the base compound. So uh, the yellow that we're seeing in all three beakers here is actually trace amounts of the B compound being in all three of them, uh, such as the nature of it. So we'll have to work around that. All right, for this part, I want to go ahead and uh, collect uh, the A compound. Remember, uh, the way we're going to uh, collect this compound is uh, we're going to add acid to it and bring it back to its insoluble form. Um, I went ahead and collected the uh, weight, uh, a tear weight. What I have here is just the cup portion and the filter paper that's going to go on these funnels over here. So for A, uh, you're going to need that tear weight for later. So that's what it was on the scale. I went ahead and did it for you. 27.9572 grams. Once again, it's the tear weight of the cup as well as the paper on the inside. And uh, after we have our compound in there, we can get the weight by difference. Okay, uh, so for this part, you want to go ahead and just use a concentrated HCl. Uh, don't use the diluted stuff. And essentially what you want to do is you want to add enough acid until this becomes acidic. Now I'm going to use this litmus paper here to check it. So I'm going to go ahead and start off by checking the pH. It should be uh, very basic right now. Remember, we use 10% hydroxide to gather this stuff. Yep, yeah, definitely on the basic end. Look at the colors here. This looks like a pH of about 14. About 14. And you should see stuff precipitating out as soon as you add the uh, acid to this. Let me pick if you can see it really well. And be careful with the concentrated uh, hydrochloric acid. It can't hurt you. Right, you should see a whitish precipitate. Yep, you see that? So you notice how it goes away? That's because uh, as soon as it mixes, it's not, it's not acidic enough to keep it out of solution. So what I like to do is you want to get kind of slowly add it until the precipitate stays after you swirl it. Yeah, you see that? As soon as I swirl it, it went away. Is 
And then uh, after it stays, I will then check the pH to make sure that this is uh, acidic. You want it to be very acidic. there now. Yeah, it looks like it's going to stay, but add the extra just to make sure, right? Yeah, this is definitely going to be acidic. But there is our white precipitate. And sometimes the pH is kind of tricky using these. If you have, it's a little bit messy, but we'll see how it looks. Just check real quick. Yeah, we're definitely in the acidic range now. Um, I would estimate a pH of about 0 or 1 for this now. Definitely brought it to the other end of the spectrum. Concentrated acid will do that. So just to compare here, uh, this was the basic version beforehand and here. So uh, in general, uh, what I like to go with for acid or base with the indicators here is uh, your cooler colors, like your your purples, uh, your blues and greens are typically the alkaline end, and then your warmer colors are the acid end, kind of in general for these. So, all right. So uh, here was the cup we were going to use. So we go ahead and we uh, slide some of this stuff out of the way so we can see better what's going on. So here we're going to do a sidearm flask. I believe you saw this during the recrystallization lab. This part, uh, the rest of this part is pretty much identical to the recrystallization lab. So you just go ahead and hook up a hose. If I can find one. Go ahead and hook it up to the vacuum line. Hook it up here. Uh, depending on your uh, your setup, you may want to clamp this down. I don't think I need to clamp it today. In here. So you go ahead and turn the vacuum on. You can hear it going, and then you want to go ahead and seal it. So uh, when you're sealing this here, you want to make sure you're using the solvent that you have in here. Uh, we happen to be using water today, so we're going to use water to wet this with. It gives you a nice seal on there. Okay, go ahead and get it in a slurry, stir it up good, pour it all at once. You shouldn't see any white powder going through here. Alright, give it a rinse. If you have extra water here, it's not going to hurt anything. That. Yeah, looks like we're going to lose a little bit in here. That's an, another source of loss. We got a, a sum in there, it looks like. I'm going to go ahead and give it one more rinse, but it, it looks to me like it's stuck on the glass, so I'm not going to worry about it too much. I have to worry about the quality, not the quantity, when it comes to this kind of thing. So then uh, this just sit in the vacuum for about 10 to 15 minutes to make sure it's fully dry. And I'm going to go ahead and, and stop the film now. I'm going I'm to move this and have it dry off camera and do the next part. But keep in mind that while it's off camera, it's drying in, the, in one of the other film hoods. Okay, for this next part here, we're going to go ahead and uh, collect compound B. And we're going to do that by adding base to it. So this should be highly acidic right now. Let me go ahead and check the pH just to make sure. Yep, highly acidic. It looks like we are about a pH of roughly zero. Checking here, remember you line up the colors here to see where it's closest to. Yep, it's pretty close to the bottom there. And just like before, uh, we're going to see a precipitate fall out of solution as we add the base to it. This is going to deprotonate the compound, making it insoluble in water. And this time you should see a yellow precipitate, not a white one. You see that? Let me bring it closer to the camera. Okay, 
And you want to keep, you want to add enough so that the precipitate stays after you swirl it. Yeah, that's not, not basic enough yet. And just like the first part, if you have too much uh, base here, it will not hurt anything. It'll still work. I'm thinking that's enough, and as soon as I think it's enough, I like to always add one more support just to make sure that I have enough. So yeah, that's definitely 100% enough. But just to make sure that my 100% estimation is correct, I'm going to measure the pH. This should be highly alkaline. Yeah, it's a little discolored from the compound itself, the yellow stuff in there. What do we got? Yeah, it looks like we're at about 10 or so. I'm actually going to add more. Um, the yellow discoloration from the compound itself, but it look, it look, it's looking like we are about 10 or so now. So let me go ahead and add one more squirt just to make triple, triple sure that we have enough pace. Oh yeah, for sure this time. We got enough base now. So it looks to me like I'm guesstimating we're about 14 right now. Yeah, right at about 14. Plenty basic enough now. I'm going to close these pH strips. Uh, you also could have used red, uh, red and blue litmus paper. This is just what I had available uh, quickly. So, but typically red and blue paper to use because it's a little bit cheaper than the four colored ones. All right, and uh, just like the last one, you're gonna need a tear weight for the cup and the filter paper. So this tear weight is 34.1807. Once again, that's a tear weight. That's the weight of this cup and the filter paper inside. Make sure we have a nice seal with the water. All right, get in the slurry, pour it all at once. Kind of like orange juice before you filter it. <laughs> Now I'm going to give this a nice crisp of water, uh, try to get a quantitative transfer here, get all of our stuff to go through into the filter. We got some discoloration down there. In theory, this should have been completely colorless, but we have something going through here. A little bit more here. We got a nice bright yellow solid appearing on the top though. I mean, I'll tilt, tilt it to show you guys. Bright yellow. That's what we want. That's the, that's the good stuff. Okay, just like A, I'm going to go ahead and let this run for about 10 to 15 minutes off camera. I'm going to go ahead and set it up in the fume hood that's right, right next to this one. And while we do the rest, we ran for 10 15 minutes. Alright, for this part, we're going to go ahead and uh, collect the neutral compound. Remember, the, this is not going to respond to acid or base. Para nitro, sorry, uh, para dichlorobenzene is not, is not an acid or base, so we have to get it, get it other ways. But remember that we, we left water in here from our earlier extraction, so we have to get rid of the water first. Uh, organic solvents are typically dried using a drying agent uh, with an, an, an anhydrous salt is used, meaning it's no water. Uh, we like to use magnesium sulfate, MgSO4, uh, commonly referred to as Epsom salt. 
Uh, the reason why we uh, magnesium sulfate is used is because you can get 12 moles of water per one mole of magnesium sulfate. But other salts can be used, but this one is very commonly used uh, in the real world as well as uh, in our lab. So uh, you basically want to add enough. You don't want to measure this one out at all. Uh, how much you need depends on how much water you have in there. So what happens is uh, this stuff will clump when, you, when it touches water. You want to add enough so that when you swirl it, you have a free flowing powder. So once again, the first parts I add are going to clump with water and any excess after all the water has been clumped up uh, will end up uh, being a free flowing powder. For me, I'll pull this closer to the camera. Hopefully it'll show up well. So we should see some clumping. It usually sticks to the bottom of the glass. You have to stick near the bottom of the glass. That's clumping with the water. So I'm going to go ahead and swirl this now. Yeah, so it, it's not a, if you have all that clump at the bottom there, it's not a free flowing powder yet. I don't have enough yet. So I'm going to add another scoop. Yeah, I technically have enough now. Some of it is free flowing, but just like before, I like to make sure I have a little bit extra just to make sure. Yep, so now I have a, when I swirl it, I have a free flowing powder, like so. And then now you need to let it finish doing its thing and let it sit for about five minutes with the wash glass on top. Uh, in the meantime, what I would normally do in a typical lab setting would be to get the tear weight of the beaker we're going to transfer to. I did it for you already. So uh, we're going to be transferring or decanting this liquid into here and then removing the solvent by evaporation. And again, the final mass by difference. But the terror mass on this one is 91.9814 uh, like grams. So that number there is the terror weight on this beaker with this watch glass. So make sure you get that number. All right, we'll go ahead and let that sit for five minutes and come back to it later. Okay, it has now been five minutes. I want to go ahead and decant this into the speaker here and then heat. So here you need to be careful that you just slowly uh, try to leave all the solid behind and get only the liquid. good enough. And then this part here, you just go ahead and let it sit on the hot plate. I recommend that you blow a stream of air across the opening to help this evaporate quick, quicker. Uh, the way you do that is uh, you go ahead and get one of these little clamps. I'm going to go ahead and cut this off now. That's definitely not heat. Situation, uh, this melting point usually ends up being bad anyway because you almost always have a little bit of the base compound. All right, I'm just going to go ahead and let that sit there in a jar for a few minutes and then we will get the mass. All right, it looks like we got rid of all the solvent. It's still pretty uh, hot. 
little discoloration. Uh, that's very likely from an uh, impure base compound, the N nitroaniline. It, it always uh, ends up in the final compound here, the N compound. Uh, it's pretty much expected. Uh, you'd have to purify this compound probably by recrystallization to get pure compound on N. Uh, the affinate base compounds will come out very pure in this procedure, but like I said, I would have to recrystal recrystallize this again to get rid of the impurities here. But we're going to get it melted point anyways and get it mass and see how it works out. All right, everybody, we're just about done. I just want to show you the last few, a few things. We've actually fully extracted all three. So let me show, show you right here what we got going on. So here we have purified A. This is the acid compound. This is benzoic acid purified. And then we have right here, uh, this is N after we evaporated the solvent. You can see a lot of it on the side there in the walls. So we're definitely at the mass by difference for that one. And then we have the base compound right here. Get a nice look at it. And then we're going to go ahead and get the weights on it. All right, we're now over at the scale. So there's our three compounds right here. Uh, so compound A, show it again to the camera. This is benzoic acid to be purified. I made sure I wiped up the bottom of the cup just to remove any kind of water. This has been sitting for well over 10 minutes. I know it's not 10 minutes, but it's been more like a half hour, to be honest. So let's go ahead and throw it on the scale and see what we got. All right, there's the weight for benzoic acid after we purified it. The chair weight is still on the cup. Get the mass by difference. Okay, compound B, meta nitroaniline, nice bright yellow color. And right off the bottom, just like before, let's make sure the chair weight is visible on the cup as well as the final weight on the scale. So remember, you need both these numbers, guys. You get the mass of the solid by difference. And I do want to point out that I had the tape on the cup when I measured it. So the, the weight of the tape is, on, is included in the chair weight. Okay, last one here, compound N. You guys know the drill. We'll go ahead and put it on the scale. Chair weight is on the beaker itself. All right, settle. Looks like we're settling at 92.2405. So get the mass by difference. And then don't forget that after you have the mass by difference, you're going to go ahead and calculate the percent of each of these that you collected. All right, for the first sample here, uh, we're going to do two samples. Uh, the one on the left in the camera should be the starting mixture, the one to one to one mixture. And then the right one is going to be the collected N compound, the dichlorobenzene. I set the starting temperature to be... 25, because uh, paradichlorobenzene had a pretty low melting point anyway, uh, starting out at 54, and we have some massive impurities here, potentially for both samples. So I started out with a low temp. And our stop temp, that looks good. It's going to go melt well before that, probably. So let's go ahead and st start this. Ramp rate 5, start. All right. It's going to, saying it's ready already. Let me fix the focus and then we will start the run. All right, remember, uh, just like uh, in the past, you want to get T1 and T2 for this. And let's start.
Okay, for the next samples here, uh, we have our purified benzoic acid and our purified m nitro aniline. So on the left is going to be the benzoic acid, like so. And then the right side is going to be the m nitro aniline. I started the starting point a little bit higher this time because I'm expecting them to melt a little bit higher. Uh, because one, they have a higher melting point as well, the purity is typically better on these two compounds in this procedure. Let's go ahead and get started out here, and then I will fix the focus. Nope. Hopefully you guys can see it okay. 